Remember the movie Twister? Well, this week, we're connecting with a real-life storm chaser. Not Bill Paxton, but rather a real-life Canadian who's built his career around documenting nature's extreme weather conditions. Picture erupting volcanoes, monster hurricanes, and ice storms that last for days. In the midst of the chaos and the beauty, that's where you'll find him. Camera in hand, smile on his face, ready to document it all. His explorations have taken him to the far reaches of the Earth, where he documents and adventures for his show, Angry Planet, which is televised in over 100 countries. Canadian Geographic magazine listed him as one of Canada's top 100 explorers, and I am so stoked to hear more about his incredible travel stories from across the country and around the globe. So please welcome adventurer George Karunas to the show. Thanks for joining me on the Northern Take, George. Oh, thanks so much, John. That was quite the intro. I appreciate that. Well, when you hear it back, what does it what does it sound like to hear your life explained in such a way? And maybe I'll get you to tell me how do you introduce yourself and tell people what it is that you do for a living when they ask. Technically, my official title is Explorer in Residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, um, and that's an honorary position that has been bestowed upon me. So I, I, I use that as a bit of my job description quite frequently because it, it sounds really great and it does sort of encompass everything I do with the Canadian geography and exploring and all these things. But yeah, I travel around the world and I document extreme forces of nature and natural disasters and I showcase them to anyone who'll watch. Where did your initial fascination with science and the power of Mother Nature come from? There wasn't one moment where I had this giant epiphany or anything like that. I grew up in Hull, Quebec, and I always loved science and nature as a kid. I was interested in things like sharks and dinosaurs, as many young boys are, especially growing up in the 70s and 80s like I did. I'm just exposing my vintage here right now, but that's all right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I grew up as a free-range kid, right? I, I would just disappear for you know, the entire day. And that was just how we did it back then. And so I always had this spirit of independence. And then I got interested in music. And so I became a musician and I was playing in bands. And then I moved to Toronto and started studying sound engineering to be, you know, to work in recording studios. And I did that for many, many years. And my mom gave me this camera. And that was, if there was any one particular moment, I'm gonna say that was probably it. This camera she gave me was a waterproof camera so I could take it out in the rain. And I had this fascination with lightning striking the CN Tower. We have the world's tallest freestanding lightning rod, and it gets struck between 70 to 100 times a year. Really? It's this wonderful conduit of n the power of nature and the urban environment of Toronto. And every bolt is 100 million volts and burns five times hotter than the surface of the sun, and it's totally spectacular. If you, if you get hit by one, you're likely going to die. But they're so beautiful. And to have this perfect target there that I could set up and try and photograph, it was just this wonderful first dip in the pool, if you will, for me getting interested in, in chasing weather and other disasters. And that's really how it got started. And then it just completely snowballed from there. Before venturing out on this extreme path of storm chasing, what did life look like for you, George? Where was your career headed? Well, I was working in various recording studios here in Toronto, and it's funny when you sort of compared me to Bill Paxton, and the movie yeah. Twister came out, I think it was 96, it was 96 or 97 when the movie came out. And I saw it and I became, that just fed into my fascination, right? I was already interested, but then that was pushed me over the edge. Yeah, the following year, in 1998, I traveled down to Oklahoma and met up with some storm chasers who were experienced and were willing to take a small number of people with them and guide them to take us to go chase storms and learn how to forecast the weather and learn how to navigate around these supercell storms that are twice the height of Mount Everest and producing these tornadoes. And so I learned from these guys, uh, Charles Edwards, uh, Jim Leonard, these legendary storm chasers that have been around much longer than I have. And so I would take my vacation time and then I would work overtime and save that time. Instead of getting money, I would take extra time off because you can always make more money. You can't make more time. And so I would even negotiate an entire month off every spring during storm season in May, unpaid to just go and live like a nomad and chase storms across Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, wherever. And I've been doing it for well over 20 years now. When you are 
facing these things. Most folks are leaving the city and you're coming into the city. Do you ever question your sanity when everybody is going the other direction? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, <laughs> the, the, the biggest example of that was probably Hurricane Katrina. So I drove from Toronto all the way down to the Gulf Coast because the, the forecast for Katrina was really accurate. We knew pretty much exactly where it was going to hit. And millions of people were driving north. Myself and a couple of colleagues, we were the only cars driving south. And <laughs> it was just this, this overwhelming sense of maybe we are doing the wrong thing, even though we've been doing this for years and every hurricane is different. They all have their own personalities and they're all very dangerous. But when, when you hear the warnings from the National Weather Service talking about how vast tracts of the United States are going to become uninhabitable and how the winds are going to be so strong to, as to turn small cars and large appliances like refrigerators into deadly airborne missiles, and you're headed straight into the middle of that. And at some point, you reach what I call the point of no return, where... Even if you decide to get in the car and leave, it's still too late. The storm is still going to hit you. And once you've reached that point, which is usually about six hours before the storm really hits, that's when you know you're, you're in. There's nothing you can do. It's coming. Hunker down. And that's scary, even to this day. I mean, I've been doing 20 hurricanes or something, and at that moment is still scary. When the fear does creep in, how do you find comfort? in a fearful moment or uh, put it out of your mind, I guess. Generally, in society, we try to eliminate fear and risk as much as we can. And I think that's a big mistake, actually, because we can learn a lot from fear. Fear is not necessarily bad. For me, it's a motivator. If I'm at the edge of an erupting volcano and I start to get afraid, that's my mind telling me that I need to double check things. I need to uh, fall back on my training. I need to check with my teammates. So it's a call to action. And people sometimes call me brave. Okay, I can, I, I see that. But it's really, for me, it's a scale. You have fear and you have curiosity. And <laughs> for, for curiosity will pull you towards something, whereas fear will push you away from it. And I just have this overabundance of curiosity that outweighs the fear. The analogy that you've made from these natural disasters to art might miss a lot of people. Uh, how does the experience of these phenomena equate to art in your mind? Well, I think we can all agree that a beautiful sunset is a work of art. I mean, there are countless paintings of sunsets. Okay, so what's the difference between that and let's say, uh, lava pouring into the ocean in Hawaii, or a beautiful white cone against a green field of this tornado touching down, right? These are forces of nature, whether it's a sunset, whether it's the northern lights, whether it's a tornado or hurricane volcano, all of these, these things are forces of nature, natural phenomena. They only become disasters when they affect us. A hurricane spinning yep. out to sea, it's not a disaster, it's just a Mother Nature equalizing pressure and temperature. That's it. But if you view it from space, from the International Space Station, it's this beautiful, abstract work of art made by Mother Nature. And so, yes, these things can be horrendous and ugly. I've seen tornadoes that have been four, almost four and a half kilometers wide, the largest in the world, and it was ugly. But I've also seen them where they've been these slender ropes dancing across a cornfield and they're just visually stunning and they only last for a few moments that's the thing that's why i go to capture them because they're so fleeting and it's hard to find them to forecast to predict to be in the right place at the right time is so very fleeting that i love to photograph them and video them so that the world can see it and to me i mean I'm, I'm actually getting emotional about this because i feel so strongly about it well, as you should. Uh, it's your life. It's your passion. And, and I can see that. You must have been obviously scared at some point or uncomfortable, but you went for it anyway. You're all about living life outside your comfort zone. So I know you take your own advice. Give us an instance when you did go perhaps further than you thought. My favorite expedition of all time uh, was certainly one of the scariest ever. And it was to Turkmenistan. 
It's a country that very few people go to. North Korea gets three times the number of visitors every year. And in the middle of the desert there, there's a, a, a pit. They call it the doorway to hell. And it's a <laughs> sinkhole. It's this 100 foot deep, 230 foot wide sinkhole. It's beautiful. If you're listening at home, hop onto your computer and just go to your favorite search engine and look for Darvaza, D-A-R-V-A-Z-A. And it's this fiery pit in the desert. It's leaking methane gas. They were drilling for, for natural gas. The whole thing collapsed. It somehow caught on fire about 50 years ago and it's still burning to this day. And so it looks like a volcano out in the sands, but it's this burning pit of gas. And so I was leading an expedition for National Geographic. I pitched this idea to them to go here and gather soil samples from the bottom to see if there was any kind of microbes living down there. And that could give us clues as to where we might want to look for life on other planets in extreme hostile environments. So it's this really cool kind of space mission, but here on Earth involving this extreme pit of fire. Charming, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it took two years of planning and preparation and trying to get permission from the government. And we were spied on the entire time. And it was just so difficult. And there's no one on planet Earth that knew more about this place. I studied every single photo, every frame of every video I could find. And as soon as I arrived there and I stepped out of the car and I walked up to the edge and I felt the heat and I saw the flames, I immediately thought, I can't do this. This is impossible. And I had an entire team of scientists, microbiologists, TV crew, all of these people depending on me. And I had so much doubt. So much so that I, I was scared, literally scared for my life. And so we spent a week camped out beside this crater and it was this gorgeous place. Nothing but sand dunes and this fire pit. And uh, I, studied it. We, we took temperature readings and measurements and we stretched fire resistant ropes across and I had a great rope rigging team, Canadian team came with me and we stretched these ropes across and I went out to the middle in a special heat resistant suit, Kevlar harness, self-contained breathing apparatus and I was able to rappel down, set foot at the bottom for 17 minutes, gather my samples and shoot some video and take some measurements and was they were able to pull me out. But stepping off the edge and putting all of your weight on this rope that is literally dangling over a pit of fire was probably the most terrifying five seconds of my life. Because you have to trust everything that you put into this project. It was a literal leap of faith. And it was amazing. 12 people have been on the surface of the moon, but only one person's been to the bottom of the doorway to hell. And it was this great accomplishment. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. Well, let me just give you a real quick description of the bottom because you're, you're standing in this spot where no human has ever been, surrounded literally by fire. The walls are glowing. It looks like a coliseum of fire. And the sound of the jet engine roaring noise of this, of this gas that's burning three feet away from you really made me feel like I was standing on the surface of another planet. And I, a little tiny piece of me in the back of my mind said this must be kind of what Neil Armstrong might have felt like maybe just you know one percent of his experience I felt that now you spend it's hard to believe 200 days a year on average on the road you're probably not doing that kind of time right now how are you filling the void in your time and in your desire to travel he hangs his head <laughs> Yeah, this has been a tough year for someone who's yeah, an brother. explorer who travels, right? I, I was in Seychelles and Japan at the beginning of 2020, and I arrived home from Japan on March 11th, and I've been locked down like everybody else since. And I've had expeditions to Papua New Guinea canceled and all the hurricanes this year, everything's been canceled. So one thing that I've been doing, aside from planning and preparing other future expeditions, um, I've been getting into virtually exploring, using VR to get at least a taste of that experience. So I've, I've been flying in a helicopter over Greenland and I've been revisiting Chernobyl, which is a spot I was at 15 years ago, and, and diving with sharks and all of these things that I would normally do in real life 
now I can do them you know, here in my office. Is this a space that you'd like to get into in cataloging and documenting your adventures in a virtual context? Yeah, I, I think it really is, it's a growing technology. You know, it, it's come so far in the past five years and it's ramping up like crazy. So I'm really looking forward to taking advantage of uh, the, 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 the popularity of various VR formats. And it's just amazing, amazing. I love it. Well, most of us aren't able to travel physically, but uh, we can explore our own backyard. And our own backyard has, and you know it, some of the best landscape scenery. What are some of your favorite Canadian destinations? And you've mentioned a 35 day road trip to get to the Arctic Circle and the Arctic Ocean. Well, like you, I've been to every province and every territory. And uh, it, I just love this country so much. We have a, a diverse geography and cultures and landscapes. It's amazing. So this road trip I did was amazing. It was a three-part filming project I was doing for the Weather Network. So there was myself and one of the meteorologists from the Weather Network, Mark Robinson, who's a very, very good friend of mine. We've been best friends for 20 years. First, we were out in East Coast for a while, and then we started this road trip from Toronto, and we drove all the way across to Vancouver, and then up to the Yukon, middle of winter, and got on the Dempster Highway. We crossed the Arctic Circle, drove across the Arctic Circle, got stuck in terrible weather, made it to Northwest Territories, then got on the Mackenzie River on the ice road and kept driving mm -hmm. north until you reach the Arctic Ocean. And there's this little sign in the snowbank on the ice road that says entering ocean. And you're now driving on the Arctic Ocean. And the coolest thing was looking at my GPS on my dashboard and seeing the little car icon driving over the letters that said Arctic Ocean. And we ended up in Tuktoyuktuk, which is the farthest northern point in Canada that you can drive to from, from mainland Canada. And it was so beautiful. We were so far north, you could look south to see the northern lights. Just stunning. There are a number of elements of that that don't quite compute for me. Driving on the ocean, for one. But secondly, <laughs> looking south to the northern lights. Um, so most auroras happen in what's called the auroral oval. So you don't get northern lights at the North Pole. It's too far north. So mm -hmm. there's this area, this ring around the North and South Pole where you get the most aurora activity. And so it's very, very possible to be too far north. And so we had to look south to see them. But these beautiful dancing curtains of green and red and purple... It's, it's something that every Canadian needs to experience at some point in their life. And we're, we're on our way up in terms of a solar maximum. So in the next two, two or three years, we're going to be reaching the top of that 11-year solar cycle. So the northern lights are going to get really good. The, that trip that you were mentioning just previous there that started out on the east coast of Canada, is there anything that uh, stands out about that part of our country for you? The people in the Maritimes are the best, particularly what, I don't know what it is about Newfoundland, they're the friendliest people in the world. Uh, one of the things I love to do out there, and it's really, really dangerous, <laughs> way more dangerous than chasing storms, it's climbing icebergs. I've done that a few times out there. And let me tell you, when you're hopping off of an inflatable Zodiac boat and climbing up onto a piece of ice that's tens of thousands of years old, that is brittle and the size of an apartment building and could explode or roll over at any moment, that gets your heart pounding, but it's amazing. You think? Holy Lord. I mean, those things are like rubber duckies in a bathtub. One small move or change in volume somewhere could cause them to topple. That's got to feel a little more unnerving than crawling under an active fault line, isn't it? Yeah, rubber duckies are far more stable than any iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> Bad analogy. No, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because they're kind of the opposite. Because with the rubber ducky, most of it is above water. But with the iceberg, most of it is below. So even if you're close by in a boat and it starts to roll, the bulk of that iceberg can come up underneath your boat, which most people don't think about. And so that's an extreme danger, of course. And so I'm sure you're thinking, why, why on earth would you go and climb one of these icebergs? But um, twice now I've gone out there to plant satellite tracking beacons on top of these icebergs to track their movements. It takes about two years for these icebergs to go from the, uh, the glaciers of Greenland through the Arctic Ocean. They, they stay locked up in the ice up there for a year or two, and then they drift down the coast past Labrador, 
out to Bonavista Bay and, and all these places out in Newfoundland. And that's, Newfoundland is a place where icebergs go to die. It's a graveyard for icebergs. And uh, there, there are websites that you can go to and they'll tell you where these icebergs are. So if you're looking for something to do on the East Coast in late June, it's probably about the best time, go iceberg chasing. Seriously, it is so much fun. You have these beautiful, gigantic blue icebergs, and some of them have these elaborate arches and spires, these truly nature's abstract works of art. And you can hop in your rented car and you can go drive along the coast to these little towns and stay at these bread and, bed and breakfasts and watch these beautiful icebergs as they slowly lumber down the shore to their un, inevitable death. And it is absolutely beautiful and totally safe to do from the shore. Don't climb them though. What I'm curious about is after you've got your heart racing and your fix of adrenaline for the day, what is it that you're doing when you get back to St. John's and on terra firma to come back to reality? Are there any spots that our listeners should know about that they might want to, I guess, uh, wet their whistle at perhaps? Well, it just so happens that St. John's has, I think, the highest concentration of bars and taverns uh, anywhere in the world, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So there's plenty On of... George Street, I think, is the name, on too, George... isn't it? Exactly, on George Street. Yeah. I was at the Duke of Duckworth one time, this pub there, and I was hanging out with a couple of friends, and out of nowhere, Rick Mercer shows up and sits down at our booth with us, and we start sharing a drink. It's like, this is like the most Canadian thing ever. It was amazing. So, yeah, there's lots of opportunities. Rick Mercer there. is the actual Newfoundland welcoming party. I think that it's, it's an obligation he has uh, to the province to greet every outsider. I think that happens to everybody. Yeah, I think it's mandated by the provincial government. It's in his contract. <laughs> he has to greet every single yeah. person who comes to Newfoundland. You've been lucky enough to travel this country from coast to coast to coast. What is it about Canada that stands out to you? What makes this country so unique and, and so compelling a place to visit? We have everything. We really do. We have mountains. We have beaches. Yeah. If you want to surf, you can go to Tofino. If you want to go and go to cosmopolitan cities we have we have that we have the, the beautiful old city of Qu you know, quebec we have all these there's something for everyone and our country is so vast that there's no possible way that you could see all of it in a dozen lifetimes so you'll never run out of things to see and do and there are certainly we think we're so humble we don't think that we have a culture but we do there are things that are uniquely Canadian. Like, for example, a few years ago, during the Olympics, during the, the Rio Olympics, the CBC broke in to their, their broadcast, a uh, primetime broadcast, to play the Tragically Hip's final concert. And it was the most unifying Canadian thing ever. Everyone remembers that particular concert, celebrating not a band from Canada, but Canada's band. They played my prom in 1987 at the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. No way. They were just a no. They were a nobody band from Kingston, right? So yeah, we have the we have these little things that really unify us as a country. Our politeness, our, our just the way that we we carry ourselves. And you mentioned, you know, the collective that is Canada, and we're a hardy bunch. But this planet that we live on is anything but, uh, you know, we have to tread lightly. How do you view the importance of eco-travel and, and having a small footprint, perhaps? People will only protect the things they love. They only will love something if they understand it, if they experience it. How can you expect someone to want to protect a forest on Vancouver Island if they've never been there, if they've never been to the forest, they've lived in an urban jungle for their entire life. So by getting out there into nature, whether it's in Canada or around the world, it really influences people to care about nature more. But it's a double-edged sword. The more people that go out in nature, the more trampled and, and endangered sometimes that nature can become. So it really is a, a balancing act between getting out there and educating people and having fun in nature, but not being too exploitive and damaging to that nature. And I sometimes feel a bit of a responsibility there because I'm able to showcase a lot of these exotic places. For example, the fire pit in Turkmenistan. I went back there last year 
and there's a parking lot there, and there's a fence that's been built around it, and there's a tourist infrastructure with, with toilets and campsites there. And I, I couldn't believe it, and I thought, oh my God, how responsible am I for the commercialization of this site? It's a balance that has to try and be struck, but ultimately, this is the only planet we have, and we have to protect it, not for us, not for the next generation, but for three, four, five, ten generations down the road. That's the razor's edge, profiling the things you love so that others can in turn feel that passion and, and protect it. But uh, that's not always what happens. Sometimes we end up exploiting. But talking about the things that we love, I got to ask, brother, how on earth did you convince this person that you are in love with uh, to marry you on the side of an active volcano? That would take um, bribery or kidnapping. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, you would think. Uh, okay, so this this story requires a little bit of setup here. <laughs> so yes, I, I got married on Thank the crater's you. edge of an exploding volcano. Uh, we were filming season one of Angry Planet, and I had been with my girlfriend. We've been living together for many years. We've been together for nine years already at this point. So it was time. And so... <laughs> We had this plan to go to uh, Tana Island in, in the South Pacific in Vanuatu. Most people have never heard of Vanuatu. It's between Fiji and Australia, a little chain of about 80 islands. But on Tana Island, there's a volcano that explodes every couple of minutes and has been doing so for the past 800 years. So it's really reliable. It's not like you're going to go there and it, it's going to not put on a show for you. So it explodes with these we call them Strombolian eruptions. These chunks of lava explode and fly hundreds of meters through the air in every direction. So it's really spectacular. And so that's where we were going to hold the wedding. So when I proposed to her, it was her birthday. We went out to our favorite restaurant and I had the TV camera there. And I told her that we're just filming a bit of backstory for the TV program. And then when dessert came around, I got down on one knee and I proposed. I said, will you marry me? She said, yes. Then I sweetened the pot by saying, what do you think about having the ceremony on a beautiful tropical South Pacific island? And then that's when I sprung to her, okay, how about on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano? And she said yes to the volcano part of the question faster than she did to the will you marry me part of the question. <laughs> so that was a good sign. And so six months later, we find ourselves traveling halfway around the world to this volcano. And I literally climbed the side of this exploding volcano in a tuxedo. And she had her wedding dress on. And as we were exchanging our vows, the volcano was sending these volleys of exploding chunks of lava through the air. And as we popped the cork on the bottle of champagne at the end of the ceremony, the volcano had another big explosion at the same time. It was just so bizarre. George, you must have an epic photo album from your wedding. I'd love to see it. When you do get home from a trip and you've been on the road for a while, what is it that you most look forward to on your return to Toronto? Yeah, a hot shower <laughs> yeah. is one. And comfort food, like a good cheeseburger. Uh, there's a lot of great places here in Toronto. Holy Chuck on Young Street near St. Clair is just, it's, they got some of the best burgers in the city. So when I'm traveling in parts of the world where, you know, I eat a lot of weird stuff when I'm traveling from fermented horse milk to uh, who knows what, it's nice to get some comfort food when you come home. That's for sure. You're born in Hull. You call the center of the universe home now in Toronto. <laughs> this is a broad country. You know, we both have this uh, fondness for Newfoundland, for the people, uh, for the culture out there. I'm in Victoria here on the left side. Everything in between all those places that I've just mentioned is home. And we can all proudly call that our backyard. Is there anywhere else in this country that you would live if you weren't in Toronto? I don't think there's anywhere in Canada that I wouldn't live, but certainly yeah, Canmore, Alberta has a bit of a special warm spot in my heart. It's, it's basically the unofficial adventure capital of Canada. There's all kinds of mountaineering and caving and ice climbing. There's, there's just so much for a guy like me to do in that part of the world or that part of, of Canada. So that's, uh, that's a place I fondly go to whenever I have the opportunity. Yeah. And it's so close to Banff too. I mean, come on, Banff? Give me a break. It's beautiful. 
There's not many inhabited places, uh, small towns in the country that have more dramatic landscape than Canmore and Banff. The mountains are out of sight there. I love it. All right, George, this is the one thing that you can't prepare for, my friend. This is the part of the Northern Take where we ask some rapid-fire things about all sorts of form of Canadiana. Can you handle this? Bring it. For sure, eh? All right. For sure, eh? What is the one Canadian thing that you can't live without? Oh, that has got to be my flag from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, the Compass Rose with the Maple Leaf in the middle, uh, as one of their explorers, they have provided me with this flag to carry on all of my trips and all my expeditions. It's a real honor to be able to, to carry this symbol of Canada and her geography with me all over the world. So that's one of my most prized possessions. What an honor. They don't just give that out to anybody that wants one, do they? No, <laughs> no, most certainly not. The one place in Canada that everyone should visit. That's easy. North of 60, get up to the Arctic. Go north. Just go as north as you can. North of 60. Great Canadian TV show and one of the ultimate destinations we should visit. The most underrated Canadian place that definitely deserves more attention. Yeah, that's got to be Manitoba. <laughs> no one talks about how... No, <laughs> like, no one says, okay, kids, get into the minivan, we're going to Manitoba. You know, no one, no one sings the, the praises of Manitoba, but they should because it's fantastic. Big sky country, there's great, for me, there's great storms out there. You've got the lakes, you've got the polar bears up north. If you go to Churchill, it's got a little bit of everything. Some of the best northern lights I've ever seen were in Manitoba as well. Well, that's not something that uh, you wouldn't hear in the Montgomery household because we're always going home to Manitoba. So uh, we'll sing its praises together here. I'm glad you're on the same page with me, brother. All right, George, what is something that you always pack with yourself when you're going away? Uh, <laughs> in my camera bag, I always have a headlamp and a roll of toilet paper in a Ziploc bag because you just <laughs> never know. You know you're an adventurer when you're traveling with your own TP headlamp and, and, a, and a bag, man. And that's the trick. You have to keep the toilet paper in the Ziploc bag because in my world, it's going to get soaked, right? So you don't want wet toilet paper. And finally, what makes you the proudest to be called Canadian? Canada has such a great reputation for being friendly and just personable. When I travel to other parts of the world, doesn't matter where I go, when they find out that I'm Canadian, they smile. And I remember being in Russia and I can't speak any Russian and these Russians I met couldn't speak any English, but they find out I'm from Canada and they're like, hockey, hockey. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> and, and, we sh and we shared a little moment. Right. So that's that's something that I really appreciate about being Canadian is our our international reputation for being polite and friendly, which in a lot of ways I think is deserved. George, thank you so much for inspiring us today with your incredible stories. And I hope that our listeners have been as inspired as I am to find their own adventures and chase down their dreams, both big and small. It is truly about getting out of our own way and trying new things out there. So thank you for that perspective. My pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this episode of The Northern Take. I'm John Montgomery, and thanks so much for taking this journey with us. 